Good evening, Clerkenwell. How buzzy does it feel just walking up from the tube? Before we get going, we're just going to share a little film with you made by our very, very dear friends at OPX. I'm going to lean down in my chair. <laughs> roll the film. Thank you, OPX. Thank you, La and team, <laughs> Liliana. So this film was made to highlight just how important design is. It is all around us. If nature didn't create it, it was designed by someone. And the theme that we're going to dig into today is about the diversity that we need in design to be able to design for the glorious diversity of of the people on the planet. We are delighted to be here at this uh, Conversations at Clark and Well series. Really pleased, and just again, what a buzz uh, walking through and, and up from the tube this evening. Some stats that make us know that we really have got to look at diversity in design. A lot of them come from our design economy research, which is one of the big things the Design Council do. Let me just share a few of the stats from that. So the first one is that when we did the research, this is 2019, only 23% of designers identify as female. So 23% of people currently working as designers identifying as female. And actually, it's even worse in architecture. And actually, around here, there's a real cluster of architecture. It's a fantastic strength. Only 18% of architects identify as female. A few more stats, 88% of design managers identify as white. And then another angle on it, which is actually about the education at the moment that's feeding into design. And actually in the last 10 years, the number of young people doing design and technology, GCSE, has dropped by 68%. The number doing design and technology, GCSE, has dropped by that amount for a number of quite complex reasons, in, including how expensive it is for schools to lay that course on and so on, you add to it the fact that our research says seven in 10 practicing designers, people working in design, did design technology research. So that's a very quick, easy equation to say there's a real issue there about us turning the talent pipeline off. So this issue, one of the things for me about the issue is what an amazing thing to do. What a career to have in design to shape the world. So it's really about the work we've got to do to attract young people into design. And critically, how are we going to work on these challenges around gender uh, and diversity of, of all sorts? So we have brought together this fantastic panel to talk about um, that this evening. Let me introduce you. So over on my left here, so we have Vicky Yang. She's Digital Art Director at Design Bridge and Partners, and she's worked on branding, advertising, social and tech, both here in the UK and in Asia. Fantastic, I mean, Vicky here. 
Simon Hamilton, he is the London Design Director of the Surveyors Collection and Associate Lecturer at the Royal College of Art. We'll be lecturing there tomorrow morning. Yeah. Moving along, uh, Emma Morley, who I used to work with a long time ago, is a designer and the founder of an organization called Trifle. And it's a commercial um, interior design practice, but working on really um, specializing the office space. So it's absolutely about office design, fit out, and then also the refurbishment, but really interesting office space. And then last but not least, we have Liliana Saldana, who is from OPX. She's an art director at OPX. And she's originally from Lisbon. She splits her time between um, Portugal and London and drawing on different cultures for inspiration. And something that might come up, very cool, she works three weeks on and one week off, which is a very interesting additional thing that she's doing at OPX, which may come out later. So, fabulous panel uh, to talk about this. The first question, and um, let's work along uh, on this first one, is just talk to us a bit about your journey. So talk to us a little bit about getting into design, your journey um, to this point. Oh, hi guys, nice to see you all here. Um, I'm Vicky Yang, so um, I'm originally from Taiwan. So when I was a kid, obviously from an Asian background culture, I was obsessed with anime and I wanted to become a comic, anime comic illustrator basically. Um, and we moved to Thailand when I was young, about 10. And went to international school, and there was quite a limited amount of courses I can take at uni, so I ended up doing multimedia design. And that's how I started going to animation, a little bit of web build, but predominantly I was specializing in animation, in motion graphics. And then um, still trying to proceed uh, with illustration in my MA, so I, went, I came to the UK in Camberwell um, College of Arts over 10 years ago, very long time ago. And um, did illustration, loved it, but went back to Asia. I find it incredibly difficult to actually work as an illustrator. So um, ended up, you know, interning, looking for places to work at in advertising. So that's how I started going to um, in ad, the art space and then start working um, in PR when I came back to the UK in technology, in social media, and now at, at one of the most established branding agency around the world, Design Bridge and Partners. So I feel like it's quite a big change of different things, but yeah, it's good to be different and experience different kinds of stages in life, you know? Uh, my journey is uh, a little bit different because of education. I think it's probably something we're going to come back to. But the very short version of this is that I'm the youngest of five children. And when uh, I was about four or five years old, we moved house. And because we moved house, I ended up going to different schools to my brothers and sisters. Um, but the schools I went to were really good, really supportive. And there was a careers convention um, during one of the years I was in my kind of uh, secondary school, I guess. And I met uh, a landscape architect. She was from America. She was telling me all about you know, architecture and things like that. And I got very excited. I'd always been creative anyway, and I loved art. But my sister, my eldest sister, is 10 years older. She had moved to America. She ended up working with some architects. And because of that, I got more interested in it. And then I went on to university, and I was the only person, or only, you know, not my brothers and sisters who went to university, because I had a very supportive education system around me. And it wasn't private, it was just state schools. It was just a very different atmosphere. And then I've always been in design ever since. So I did my degree in Nottingham. Although I come from London, I really wanted to escape London. And people thought, why are you going outside of the M25? There's nothing here. I disagreed, and I'm so glad I did it, because then it meant I discovered places like Newcastle and Derby and Leeds and Loughborough and all of the rest, and even invested in, in Nottingham and loved it, and discovered Paul Smith as well. And um, I've never sort of given up. I've been doing design in all sorts of different iterations, but it actually kind of, I think, runs through my veins. So that's how I got into it, really. I did my degree in Nottingham as well. It's a great, yeah. really, really I great place. Really great city. place. And actually, just one thing to pick up on there, that thing about a person, a teacher, someone who comes to school and captures your imagination and ignites something in you. Yeah. Isn't that often the way? And then you hopefully need other support around, but that is just so, so important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Changed my life. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Emma, your well, story. Yes, yes, yes. yes. 
This is a very supportive crowd, isn't it? <laughs> it's a home so crowd. Nice. It's a home so crowd. So nice. <laughs> Um, I feel that that leads um, very nicely, actually, into my experience, which was where um, at school um, I was told categorically I could not take art GCSE because um, I refused to draw a still life fruit bowl and I did an abstract. So um, uh, my my experience was very different to yours, Simon. I did um, I, I actually kind of ended up going into drama and then going on and doing drama and theatre studies at uni, which um, I, it's only now, years later, that I realise it's quite relevant to to um, to what I do in terms of uh, creating experiences for people. Um, but after after uni, um, it was in my third year of uni, I actually started my first business, which was selling vintage clothing, um, which gave me a really good sense of what running a business meant. Um, I then went travelling around the world picked up lots of interesting experiences and stimulus and inspiration. Um, and um, it was shortly after that that I, that I met you, Minnie, um, where we worked together at an amazing place called What If, um, where I literally stumbled upon What If by chance. I met somebody that I met in Greece. She said, what are you doing in the middle of Baker Street in the summer? I said, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I really need a job. And she said, give me your CV. And that was how I got that job. So, um, uh, and, and that was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant kind of second university. It was like a university of creativity. We worked with so many incredible people at What If. Um, they are just the most, yeah, incredible bunch of people, all with an enormous entrepreneurial spirit. And actually, uh, it was towards the, the kind of fifth year that I was there, I started getting itchy feet again. Um, But I had realised that what was amazing, one of the most amazing things about What If is we had these incredible offices, which you will well remember. We had a room, the boardroom was called the Treehouse. There was no boardroom, anything boardroom-like about it. It was just lots of sofas and beanbags and lots of trees outside. Hence, it was the Treehouse. None of the meeting rooms had tables. We had a football uh, table in the reception room. And I'm going back now like 20 plus years right so this was the time when offices were kind of gray grayish beige boring boxes um, and I had somehow landed in this incredible wonderful inspirational place and clients would come to us from their gray grayish beige boxes and their whole behavior would change they took off their ties I mean I think we told them they weren't allowed to wear ties they often took off their shoes Um, you know, they just completely relaxed and were able to come to us and basically have these amazing creative workshops and um, really, like, inspirational sessions. They'd go away completely, um, you know, revived and rejuvenated about their work. And... um, and, and I just kept thinking, this, this, is, this is kind of magical. Like, these people are just... All, all that we've got here is, like, some colour and we don't have tables and we don't do things in the way that ordinary offices do. So I said to the founders of What If, you know, I think there's something in this. I think we should be offering this to, to our clients. And they said, well, we're not so sure, but how about you redesign our offices for us? So they let me do that for a year. I learned on the job. I have absolutely no architectural or interior design training or education i'm very envious of people that do um but i've learned learned completely on the job and 13 the business that i run now is 13 years so old so um it's it's gone all right but um but yeah as i as i said to you guys when we met last week you know i always feel like it's um my hindrance and my superpower not being traditionally traditionally trained in that there's been a lot of times when I've had massive imposter syndrome and I thought, God, I don't belong in this room with these people. Um, less so now, but I did a lot, certainly, the first few years. Um, but equally, it's become a bit of a superpower because I feel like I've always been able to look at things through a completely different lens. And I have quite a different set of experiences, to, especially in office design, especially in the commercial world, which is almost all full of men and um, there's a few more women now certainly than when I started but um but but yeah that's me sorry that was really long-winded wasn't it <laughs> thank you thank and some other nice little themes coming there while well, I'm just going to mention is travel 
is you know school of life and just perspectives it gives you and, and of course full of diversity Liliana tell us about your journey thank you for holding space to have me um, so yeah that's a great beginning so I think a lot of what I do today has to do with my journey um, and especially the beginning and how I was build my imaginary and my world I guess um, so I'm Portuguese. Um, I was uh, born, um, I'm the daughter of a Mozambican mother and uh, East Timor father. I grew up in Portugal by the coast and uh, in a new city, one of the newest cities in, in Portugal, and where a lot of people coming from African uh, Portuguese colonies um, were. So this was a melting pot of references for me. I always, like, it really expanded my vision of the world because I was in the middle of the countryside of Portugal, but I had all these references of other countries um, that were, you know, um, not so close. Um, when I was, so I was always fascinated by images. I loved images. I was obsessed with images, like looking magazines, fashion magazines, um, David Attenborough um, book, Life on Earth, was a reference. I would spend a lot of time looking at them. And this to say that um, when I found out about uh, visual communication, I thought this is where I want to go. So I went to fine art school in Lisbon, which was also very important, was also very important for me, because there my references were not only about design, it was about um, aesthetics, um, Fine arts, yes. Um, all the people that I've met also brought me a lot of other references, you know. So that was also very important for me, I think. Uh, so when I started to work in design um, and working precisely, precisely with brand design, I was quite surprised. I was, I was welcomed. It was because of all those references, all that world that lived in my head that maybe was not the expected design solutions that really um, and also, I was very lucky to have those people that welcome that work, workness, uh, that difference. Um, so yeah, that's how I end up in working in brand for so long. Seriously, I think a lot of times I'm an, an artist that was not brave enough to do something else. But I feel like really um, quite um, welcomed in the world because of that different thinking. So that's what I also try to instigate with my team. There's some people here. Um, I organize in my studio something that is called the Curiosity Talks, where I invite someone that is not a, my intention was not to uh, invite someone that was a creative, but someone that could share their stories uh, with us so we could get out of our uh, seats and travel and discuss and exchange um, visions over the world. So I was, I, I, I've been privileged also to bring those ideas to the table in, to my team and they are very accepting. Um, so yeah, and then yeah, projects keep going and uh, yeah, I can, well, let's continue our conversation. That was Thank it. You. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And, uh, and I know for a fact that that different way of thinking is something that OPX really value. Came up in a conversation just before the session. So, yeah. Okay, so this one, and we will go along in a row again, because it just gives you all a breather, and then they'll be pushing the questions out. This first one is, many of us will be aware that lack of diversity in the design community can lead to some lack of inclusion and bad design, I would go as far as saying, when it plays out in the world. What do I mean by that? So for example, we were, we've all heard about the crash test dummies, which are based on the male torso, which has led to a lot of women dying in car crashes that really needn't have done because of how the crash, crash test dummies have worked. You know, we know the fact that um, there are certain things like a phone. For a while, some of the phones didn't fit the female hand so well. They seem to all be designed for the male hand. There are hand dryers that don't recognize darker skin. You know, there are lots of really quite tangible things that play out 
and you can just see the lack of de uh, good design. I was actually in a place the other day, very, very male bastion, and the mirror in the bathroom was up here. I mean, just a tiny thing, but a design issue. So actually, just going along, have there been any examples so far where you have seen it play out when there is a lack of diversity in the design team? Okay, um, so my experience has been quite fortunate. I've, I feel like coming from Asia, and um, this is not praising uh, the current situation in the UK or in Europe, but coming from Asia, there was a lot of um, diversity issues that wasn't being addressed. But um, what I'm trying to get, um, get to here is that one of the things that really stood out for me when I um, started working was that uh, I was working for one of the, they are the biggest department store in, in Thailand, in Bangkok. They actually own one of the um, football stadium in the UK, or football team, I think. But I went to the office, tried to pitch for a work, and then I remember seeing a load of girls coming in for a, uh, um, a prep for a fashion walk in the department store, the, the biggest um, the headquarters. And I've noticed, like, and I never came, came across my mind, I noticed, I was like, why is everyone here white? You know, um, the brands that they're, they are um, walking down are all Thai designers. Why are they all white, 20, mostly Russian, Eastern European models for brands that should be, you know, specifically designed for Thai designers? Then it got me thinking, actually, I have thought about why are these clothes in Thailand, Thai department stores specifically? And I think that can also um, um, be the same situation for other Southeast Asian countries. Why are these clothes so long, like trying to mirroring European bodies? And, you know, that's not us. So I felt really alienated and felt like just very confused. And, and that's why I kind of thought, you know what? There, there's a lot of diversity issues need to be addressed. UK could be better. We acknowledge it. We should definitely push forward to it. But like where I came from, what, the, the thing that really stood out is this case. And I felt like we should, yeah, um, again, we should give us a, a, some applause that we've, we've done really well here. But yeah, there, there's more work to be done. Thank you, and great to have context, actually, and, and not beat ourselves up. We're on a journey, but we're, we're doing some good stuff. Simon? Um, I think I've got two examples, really, and they may not be what you expect. Um, firstly, it's to do with uh, ability or disability, and that's because I had an accident quite a few years ago. Um, I was knocked off my scooter, and I ended up on crutches, and therefore I also ended up in a wheelchair for a, a little bit of time. And I went to um, an exhibition space, I won't say where, but I was in the wheelchair and it was designed for people who, who were walking. And so I couldn't actually see the exhibits because I was too low. And that really opened my eyes and I was just so shocked because of course I hadn't seen things from that perspective before. And, uh, and now, I mean, as I said, that's a long time ago, but I'm very, very aware of how, and I tell students this as well when we teaching them that you have to think of everybody you need to be kind of aware of other people's perspectives and viewpoints and and that can be literally heights and physical things and that and because I had that personal experience I'm I'm ultra aware of that so that was the first one and the second example I have really um, was to do with age in as much as there's sort of not enough diversity in in terms of uh, a range of people that might get employed for a specific role and I went for a role where I could do the job, but um, I think I was seen as being perhaps overqualified. That's what I was being told each time. And I think at the time I was perhaps giving out the wrong vibes and I was going for the same sort of job. And it wasn't as a designer, it was as a studio manager. Um, and each time they said that, and I think either uh, you know, you're too old or you're too expensive, but they said, oh, you're over-experienced. And then I, I found out that the people that they had employed were younger um, and that I think that they didn't really last because to do those sort of roles you need experience and so those people didn't last in those jobs so you know it kind of backfired so my experience has been a little bit different to what you know some other people's is. Interesting lovely examples thank you. Emma. So before I say what I'm going to say I have to say I love the underground I'm a big fan I've lived in London for 30 years Big, big fan of the tube. However, there are something like 270-odd 
tube stations and something like 90 of them are accessible. I was wondering if this is what you were going to say, Simon. Because, um, and for me, the first time I ever really thought about that was um, when I became a, a mum and started, you know, using London through a whole different, uh, you know, a whole different set of um, eyes um, as a mum. And one of the things that I think is so tra challenging, I took my niece out a couple of weekends ago and I could not believe, so this was an accessible station, so it's Stratford, so you've got all the new, um, you know, the, the new Lizzie line, all of that, fabulous. But to get, even to then get around, I mean, I had to, it took me like tw at least twice as long because of how everything is, is interconnected. Um, and, and I just think, you know, if you, if you are in a wheelchair, if you've got any kind of disability and you're dealing with that on a daily basis, I mean, nightmare, absolute nightmare. And obviously you've got to think about where you live in accordance with where those accessible stations are so um so yeah do love the underground though <laughs> do. But, yeah. a, a very real issue Challenging. that is impacting a lot of people every yeah. day yeah absolutely yeah thank you liliana yeah, so thoughts yep <laughs> so uh, sorry um so two i had two thoughts and one of them was the car seat belts it really when i discovered this i was mind blown and i just wanted to make a note on it because until at least in the 70s, the average man was actually based on the European body, male body. So there is all other bodies that are out of that equation. And I was just like, how come? Because we take it as a safety, um, as a, a safety system. So we believe, and that's one of the things of design, if it's uh, you know, communicated well, it gives us trust in the object and, you know, in the tests and all of that. So I was very surprised by that one. Um, my first one is actually a scissor. I'm lefty. So, you know, very basic object is all over the world. We don't question it. You know, it's given in schools. There's an amount of, an, you know, huge amount of them around, right? So even if, uh, and, and it's for the majority. Uh, we are 12% of the population. It's one object, so if I think like, okay, we would, so I don't know if you, there is a scissors experts here, but um, <laughs> no, no, because I don't know how it's, you know, if it has been developed or something else, but um, my question is, could we develop one object so we don't waste, you know, like creating two for the other, you know, they're 100%, so yeah. That is, it's a fabulous everyday object. Um, yeah, m m my mother, did finally find some years and years and years ago, left-handed scissors, but it was hard. Yeah, so I wanted to say I cut with my right hand, but I know I had to adapt. And that's what is really, it's in your head, you had to adapt. And as a lefty, you had to adapt to several things. Um, and it's that kind of like imposed behavior yeah. in a way. Yeah. I know we're all very different and how we can we get all those answers for all these dif different people, right? Yeah. That's, I think, the uh, yeah. question for us. It's a great example. I had twins, and I very quickly learned the world is not designed for double buggies. <laughs> I mean, they maybe did the work on a single buggy. It was so not designed for um, double buggies. Right, next one. Simon, you're on, you on this next one, please. Yep. So what do you think, then, are some of the greatest challenges that are getting in the way of making the design sector more diverse? Um, I don't think it's just the design sector. I think it's kind of a society thing, actually. Um, I think that the design sector perhaps needs to be more open to having uh, role models and people that may seem like they're not going to be, you know, superstar designers, but they can offer something. They can actually celebrate something else. Now, when I started in design and I, I set up my first uh, consultancy in 2002, I really, really wanted to fit in, and I wanted to sort of be part of everything. And then I realized quite late on, though, that actually fitting in wasn't the way to go. It was actually about standing out. And I think if that is supported and celebrated, and I think it is more like that now because of the, the recent kind of pandemic and everyone's had a time to reset, um, I think that giving people the opportunity to be themselves, whatever that may be, 
I think is a really positive thing and it can be encouraged. And I think the design community do come together very well. This is a perfect example of it. Um, people are, are, I think, much more expressive and also welcoming than perhaps other industries. And, uh, and I think that maybe other industries can learn from the design community. So I think it's a big education path. It's not going to be done all overnight. Um, it's kind of small steps. And um, we, we kind of, it does vary depending on which country you're in. We're all very positive here. We're in London, um, very cosmopolitan. I've just been um, abroad recently, and, and there was a kind of a very different, more formal approach to design and how you talk about it and how you communicate it. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done, but it depends on you know culture, society, and, um, and us just not, not giving up, really. Yeah. Can I um, turn to you, Emma, actually, at this point? And because I think there's a, some really interesting personal insight from you that you've gained regarding the requirements for diversity in the workspace, in, in space, in a spatial sense. Tell us about that. So um, I have been diagnosed with a condition called many ears, which if anybody doesn't know what it is, it's a vestibular disorder. And um, this is kind of, therefore, puts me um, in the, the bracket with the millions of other people who have invisible disabilities. I think the stats are something like 20% of the population um, have a disability and 70% of those are invisible. Um, and as a workspace designer, this is just thrown a whole new um, lens for me on, on what I do. So um, people with vestibular disorders tend to have balance issues and they um, have issues with, um, it can be impacted by uh, light or sound. So at different, different times I might have sound sensitivity or light sensitivity or motion sensitivity, all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, and for me personally, it kind of, it comes and goes. So today, hooray, I'm here, you know, pretty good. But, but literally any second now, I could have a massive vertigo attack and just have to lie down on the floor right here. So um, it's obviously, I've, I'm kind of used to it now. I'm three years into this um, journey. Um, and everybody that I work with and I know and all my friends, obviously, everybody knows about this. So if it, if it happens, it, it just happens. My daughter is here, actually, and she, can, she, will, she will tell you, you know, it's, um, it, it can literally just come out of nowhere and, and, um, and that, will, that will impact. So on and everything, you know, so I always think, God, what if I was like getting married? Do you know what I mean? Like, it happened, you know. So, and these kind of situations, um, I'm always quite nervous about now. I didn't used to be so much because uh, stress exacerbates the, the condition that I have. So, in terms of space and how we think about space, I think, um, I mean, I've always, I've always designed spaces to really consider all types of, of people and, and, and their experience at work. So, for example, if you're just having a really shitty day at work, you know, the last thing you want to do is be in a big open plan office around, around uh, lots of people. So we've always designed into our spaces like other, other types of um, areas that you can work from. So whether it's a bit of a lounge or a kind of quiet area, um, those, those types of spaces. Obviously now that for me is um, is absolutely critical and we have a little zoom booth in our work which is my little safe sanctuary when I'm having a wobbly day as I call it and I might just have to go and lie, lie down there and um, if I didn't have that you know it would be it would be kind of embarrassing I mean I have been in situations where I have literally just had to lie on a bathroom floor for four hours in a public place and um, so when, when I think we, we have a real responsibility as designers to be thinking about so many things, right? When we're whatever it is, whether we're designing a product or, or a space, and um, and I feel so passionate about this and so strongly about this now. So it's when you're when you're designing a space, it's thinking about what is that? What is the experience? Not just obviously of yourself, but you've just got to have all these other. Like you're saying, you talk to your students. It's just 
thinking 360. You've just got to put a totally different lens on it. So, you know, for me now, lighting is a massive one, and I am really badly impacted by lighting. And I know we spoke briefly about migraines as well. I mean, the the, the volume of people suffering with migraines is shocking. Um, and, you know, people, something like one and a half million people have long COVID. You know, that's another thing that can be impacted by lighting. So there are so many things that we can be sensitive to. And, of course, that's an incredible challenge for us. We cannot possibly design absolutely everything for absolutely everyone. But I think it's just really thinking, OK, if I'm designing a big, this, the client wants a big open plan office, what are the other types of spaces that I need to build in here just to make sure that we have, um, we, we're looking after people? Because spaces are powerful. Architecture is powerful. You know, you can heal. You know, when you think about the design of, uh, of certain healthcare spaces and hospices, the way that we design those spaces has an incredible impact and so we have to think like that now with, with all of the spaces that we're designing. Lovely. And thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, what, that way is going to bring such strength and super more superpower to the work that you do because you'll be designing hopefully, in, hopefully. in, in such a sensitive and, in, and intentional way. Um, let me come over to you, Vicky, and ask how much are you finding this is on clients' agendas? How much is diversity something that the clients you work with talk about, think about, care about? Yeah, so, well, absolutely, all of the, um, from my experience from, you know, starting in ads to PR through tech to branding to social media, I feel like it's a given. Um, and I think as, a, as an industry, spe specifically for creative and design digital industry, we're quite woke in that sense. So I feel like, especially a lot of the clients that we work with are all global clients. So a lot of times it's a given that client requests specific, um, sorry, not specific, uh, a very diverse talent on shoots. So a lot of times we'll be shooting um, global campaigns that's ranging from all markets or is it a modular um, um, system throughout different markets, um, ways. There are also times which I find actually is quite, it's very nice to hear from clients. They're actually requesting for a specific diverse team in the agency. So I think that's that's also really nice to hear. However, I think that sometimes, you know, they, there will be cases where clients weren't thinking. So as agencies, we do have to provoke and ask the question, is that not just the models or the talents are using on this project, not just the designers or the creator on this project you're using, how about your suppliers? How about the uh, recruitment agency, the middleman that you're using? Are they diverse enough? The film crew you're, you're about to hire, how diverse are they? Because they can, you know, working at the moment, we're so globalized, everyone's everywhere. Someone can literally bring to, come, come into a project and bring a completely diverse, different perspectives to, to the project. And it's most of the time, it's not being thought through. So I think I've been quite fortunate, especially um, in Design Bridge and Partners. A lot of my seniors are mostly females, um, and all from also a lot of them from Southeast Asia, like myself. So I think that's quite nice to to hear that you know it's not just I'm I'm alone in this agency as the white uh, sorry as the one a minority, and um, so I would definitely encourage that you know if you think you're diverse enough, keep think again how how much more questions can you ask around. Yeah, and of course, that mm. might not be in the core team, depending exactly. on any project, but how, mu how do you make sure that you bring those other voices in yeah. through other stakeholders, engagement uh, exactly. sessions, and so on? Um, thank you. Liliana, so I've got a quote I want to share here. So there's a quote from San Francisco-based designer and author Fabrizio Teixeira, who wrote about the difference between equality and equity in design. And he says, diversity is enabled by inclusion, inclusion is enabled by equity. What do you think the benefits are that are brought by having equity in the design sector? I think actually all the, um, the, what was said in all the examples, by your example, your example and your example, that's what equity is about. What is saying that actually when you pass through uh, the experience, when you elevate uh, people's work, that's when equity actually is working. And I think um, equity in, our, in, our, uh, in the community of design 
would mean that we would be more empathic, more capable, um, more stronger by that, because it's the collaborative, the reunion of all those elements. Why? Because I think um, by giving the space, by holding the space to, to someone or something, uh, you allow it to understand their challenges, um, uh, the barriers that exist, like in a wheelchair you would see, you know. And if we include more people in this conversation, in the design community, we'll have more chance to have those perspectives. And that's what I think Vicky was mentioning too. Um, and I think there is another type of equity that we um, should be also thinking about and has to do with the diversity, but is equity in what is good design in a way? Um, because I think there is a lot of knowledge, uh, experiences, and that was never brought into the conversation. What's good design? I'm talking about black people, POC people, you know, like, um, but also um, indigenous knowledge, for example, has been quite under. Uh, we never categorize. We call craft some kinds of expressions and solutions that people. Um, gave around the world, so non-Western references, right? I think we need that. So the more we explore those fields, the more we bring um, all those knowledge, and we are very curious about it, the more we can make this actually passing from equity to just a just world, right? So this is the process, I think. So. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you. So I am mindful of time. We were late starting, but I'm thinking, I don't know where you've all got to go to. So I'm thinking I still need to bring us into land. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, uh, one quick fire round, as it were, and then questions. So very, very quickly, kind of one sentence from each of you. So here we are talking about this. Where are we going to be 10 years from now? What 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 do you see in terms of the div uh, diverse design sector ten years from now, Vicky? Oh, um, I think coming from digital and social media background, obviously everyone's talking about AI. So the diversity is actually not the we we no longer be designing anymore. We'll be directing. So because creation isn't creativity, so that diverse and create creative thinking in creative planning is really important. But yeah, I think unfortunately there will be a bit less of the designing part, but the, the actually strategically designed around things is the, where we're gonna go. That's a whole new talk, which we'll be doing at 10 o'clock this evening. <laughs> Simon. Um, before I answer that, I wanted to quickly say that, you know, you're asking me about what does the design industry do about diversity? I think having this platform, these conversations is what design is doing. I don't know about other industries, but I think design is doing an awful lot. And I want to quickly mention that, you know, the United in Design, for instance, set up by Sophie Ashby, Alexandra Dawley, that is all about diversity, giving people opportunities that didn't exist before. You go to London Craft Week, there's a lot more diverse makers that I didn't see before. So I think the design, of course, it's a long way to go, it's doing an awful lot. In 10 years' time, I think, you know, Things do change ra rapidly and then things don't. I think AI is a tool. I don't think we'll all be taken over. I think we should use it, embrace it, and not you know, become robots because we are still humans. We want that interaction, that human touch. I think that's very important. That always will be. We have emotions. Um, and I think that, yes, we will hopefully be in a better place in 10 years' time. That's my utopian view. Thank you, thank you. Emma? Two really quick things. I will be quick, though. Um, I think that sustainability will just be embedded in everything. So it's not like, should we make it sustainable or not, right? That's just got to be given, here, God, here to please, that. 10 years' time. Um, and I think the other thing is that um, I, I, it's a hope. It's a real hope um, that creativity is more embedded in schools because I just I cannot abide the way that, that we are being pushed down very specific route in terms of our education and um and i i really hope i really hope that that changes thank you liliana well uh let me think about this because i think there's a lot of points <laughs> here um i think we need to understand really that design you know like i believe that designers can be bridge makers 
and really have you, we are we can be really important in the ways we need to adapt to the challenges that come ahead. And um, by saying this, I think the storytelling, really think about our strength, okay? And not just like, we know that like a lot of uh, the answers we are giving are feeding a system that is a capitalist system. And we are in the process of that, questioning that. And I hope like in 10 years, it was the question 10 years, that we are doing that more. And I also think, another thing, uh, we learn a lot about human-centric design. I really think it's time to, to stop that. We build design is everywhere. There was the video. We take space in this planet. We need to understand that and create like life-centered design. You know, like really try to not think only at human level, but if sustainability is a given, not more than that, take out the men of the pyramid and put it on the equation that needs to be done, that we are here taking space of all of this. And I don't know, I know that it's a big thing, but it, it needs to be in a bit in our motivator, because then, yeah, AI can be just be a tool. And, you know, like we try to just m do the best that we can. But I think that is little, um, I think we need to disconstruct the bridges that were done also by design and by doing that anyway, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Thank you. Guys, uh, sorry, you understood. Yeah. And that's the 11 o'clock event we're going to be running later with a glass of wine because that is a lovely, big, big, big one. So, questions. Anyone got any questions for the panel? I thank you all for your contributions. It's amazing. Um, I was wondering, like, um, Liliana, you spoke a lot about informal knowledges. Um, I'm a, an associate lecturer as well. So, um, like, I uh, try to engage with, like, younger audiences and universities and make space for ways in which like our, our own practices within design um, maybe don't make space for others. And I'd like to ask what ways in which you guys have found it easiest to integrate other people from cultural backgrounds, possibly, um, um, and any other form of um, marginalized community into your practices and the ways that you work for the world. How do we do it? How can we do it? Well. That's, I think it's just awareness, being really like, um, and aware that there is other ans uh, there are things that you can look at. Every time that you start a brief, look at what is around and really think about the voices you want to highlight. And so that's how I would do, like just recently, um, we were working with a client and we were like looking at um, illustration and, uh, you know, like just really going through and see illustrators that, you know, really dig, try to find illustrators that are in Africa. It was hard. African, okay, Africa is a big continent, but even focusing on certain countries, how can I access uh, those illustrators? What, are, what is happening in, in South America? You know, I wanted, I had the curiosity to do, to do it, right? And the job didn't go ahead, but I'm still looking. So if you guys have references, let's exchange. You know, like it's the continuous work not just stopping in the, the job. I think is is that. And also, this is very important because you just introduce yourself. Now I know that you're doing a project. You know, I can ask you what it is. It's all of that. Yeah, I, I want to add something. Um, the way that I've hopefully given people a voice is by doing a, what I call a designer series. And I did this in 2021, 2022. And I'm going to do it again. And the first series was, was kind of all social media and I chose a number of different designers who were already working but they were at different stages in their career and they were of different backgrounds different nationalities and then put them all in this kind of series on my um, Instagram and LinkedIn and that was a deliberate thing to bring people together that didn't know each other but they were all sorts of you know areas and um, uh, different diversities and I'm doing that with the University of Plymouth and I did that last year and we're doing it again. And it's basically hoping to give the students that are about to um, graduate um, the opportunity to be seen, but also confidence and to learn how to present themselves and represent themselves. So um, it's going to be during the summer. We've just had a, a Zoom call where I'm sort of telling them what the whole process is about. And then the tutors at the university will choose a number of different students, hopefully be more than last time. I think it was six of them. Maybe there's going to be 
eight or ten or so. And then I interview them and then put them on my platform um, and my social media. And then it gives them some more exposure. It hopefully builds their confidence and also helps them build their network as well. So I've sort of done that as a sort of mini project of my own. And I hope that grows and people can share and do more of that. So that's one way of you know giving people a space. Hello, thank you for subtly blowing my mind with everything that you've shared. Um, my name's Vivian, I'm an inclusive designer and I work at a company called Motion Spot. And hearing your passion and everything you shared about the importance of diverse thinking, inclusive thinking, thinking about disability and all different experiences, and also taking mankind off the top of the pyramid, so essential. My question is, we care about it, but we have clients. How do we get our clients to care about it as much as we do? Like, would each of the panel be able to give like a practical example of how their clients have benefited from this diverse and inclusive way of thinking? Yeah. Um, so what I find, educating client is very freaking hard. Um, <laughs> especially we've got bills to pay, you know, we've got, we've got a schedule, you know, there's other clients, not just one client. But what I find really um, beneficial in a lot of the projects that we have done and in, you know, uh, around agency as well is to actually, without having to go straight and be like, have you thought of this? Have you, have you done this? Should you be doing this? Rather than going so straight in, show them p examples, give them a little seminar, workshop of like what's currently other, other the um, competitors are doing, what other things that's working really well in this area. Then you kind of slowly drip feed them this, this thought. And perhaps, you know, we have clients that come back be like, that's really useful. Can we look into a bit more? Obviously, that it, it's, it's a small step, but it's, it's better than just going and gun blazing and be like, have you thought of this? Nah, we're not gonna, we don't have budget. Rather than doing that, small drip them slowly bit by bit. And just make sure that you have the right people in your team to be on that in that journey with you and with the clients as well. So I think that's how I would see this. I would just say, yeah, you have to get under the skin of the client, understand them, really know what their motivation is for doing the project. And that can be, as I agree, actually, with um, workshops and not just going in saying, yeah, we've got these amazing colours, look at these new furniture. It's not about that. It's actually about them. And why are they even doing this project? Do they really need it? Even though you might think, actually, they're going to downsize it by what comes out of this workshop. It's better um, design and better thought than, than just saying, yeah, we're going to make the biggest thing ever. So I think responsibility is a key thing. And education, again, telling the client, you know, that, that we are on this together um, and we want you to be happy. We want you to kind of have a space that you really appreciate that works for whatever your purpose and whatever your, your reason is for doing it. Um, key thing for us, it kind of answers both of your questions in a way, is um, and similar similar to what you're saying in that we will not do we don't even put pen to paper until we have done a lot of listening and when uh say for example it's a, a ceo somebody very senior that comes to us in their senior leadership team and they've all they've all got a lot to say about how they want their office to be we obviously listen um, but the next step is to say right who else are we talking to and we make sure that we talk to people across the whole section of this. So if, we, if it's a business of 300 people, we are going to be talking to somebody from every department, every ranking, new people, junior people, because it's not about, it shouldn't, shouldn't just be about what the senior leadership team want. So that is absolutely fundamental to, to how we, we work and design. I would agree. Can I just say, I would agree with that because I didn't do that in the past and I lost a project because of it because I presented to the, uh, well, I had a first meeting with the MD and we got on really well. I thought, I know this project is going to be great. Then I presented the, the schemes and everyone hated it because I hadn't included them. So I learned that lesson the hard way. It is rare that the people at the top really, really understand actually what people on every other layer need from a space. Um, one way can be, and I think that sometimes it's useful, um, you do all the journey and all of that, but instead of, for example, showing just that option, that it, because we take the client in a, in a journey, 
and sometimes he know he thinks he knows what he wants or he knows what he wants um, but if you think there is something that is can be valuable you you try to either take two stories you know like kind of put the universe like um, those di different universe back to the to the it's all for the same story but creating like maybe different momentums that you can highlight the, w the thing that you were looking for to highlight. I, I think this is all in the relevance of um, what the client needs and what they are asking for. But I was just thinking about like, I know it's, it's quite challenging and that will be um, a bit of a journey to change loads of things. But I think it's bit by bit, like how Vicky was saying, but yeah, maybe also di diversifying the, the answers sometimes so they know that like, yeah just brought different content into to the story. Thank so. you, thank you. We could have asked loads more questions. So the very first thing, just the most massive thank you for our fantastic panel. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm hoping, I'm looking at them for a nod. I hope none of them are rushing off. So I think they're staying around hopefully for a drink. So grab them and, and keep the conversation going. Um, two quick things about the Design Council. Anyone who would like to find out more about some of our design economy research and stats and so on, just go to the website designcouncil.org um, and you will find our design economy research. There's loads of it. There's lots of real detailed information. Next big flag, we are Design for Planet mission. Um, is really key for us. We've done two Design for Planet festivals so far. Uh, in the last two years, we have our next Design for Planet festival this October the 17th and 18th. Um, it's actually going to be, um, the live part will be at the University of East Anglia in Norfolk, but we will be live streaming it around the world, aiming for about 10,000 people, hopefully, to join us from last year. It was over 88 countries around the world. So put that in your diary. And the final, final thing is to say, Clark and Well, thank you for having us. What a fabulous festival. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>